Welcome to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where we feature top leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry with your host, Drew Hendricks. Now, let's get started with the show. Drew Thomas Hendricks here. I'm the host of the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. On this show, I talk with leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry. Today, I've got a very special episode. We are going deep into the Virginia District. Distillery Association and the Virginia Distillery with Gareth Moore. But before I formally introduce him, got to have the sponsor message. Today's episode sponsored by Barrels Ahead. Barrels Ahead, we work with you to implement a one of a kind marketing strategy, one that highlights your authenticity, tells your story, and connects you with your ideal customers. In short, we help wineries and craft beverage producers unlock their story to unleash their revenue. Go to barrelsahead.com today to learn more. Today, I'm super excited to talk with Gareth Moore. Gareth is the CEO of the Virginia Distillery Co. Welcome to the show, Gareth. Thanks very much, Drew. Appreciate you having me. Oh, thank you so much for being on. So, Gareth, talk to me about the Virginia Distillery Co. I mean, I could talk about it all day. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe you tell me where to start, or maybe that's the way to start. Yeah, let's start let's see how it starts. So really, a, it's a really a family legacy on how it began from what That's right. Yeah. Talk to me about your yeah, dad. Absolutely. George. Yeah, so let's see, Dr. George G. Moore, he didn't like being called doctor. He had a PhD, right? So, you what know, was he wasn't a medical yeah. doctor. Econometrics. And then he had another one that he earned. That was my like least favorite book in the MBA program. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's one that people steer away from. Maybe maybe there wasn't a lot of, you know, competition in the category. So dad went for econometrics, but, and that that's actually what brought him over here. So he was Irish immigrant to along with my mother on the product of a Mixed marriage. My mother was from the North, a Catholic in Northern Ireland, and my father, a Catholic in the Republic. And they met during the Troubles, and dad got a scholarship to George Washington in, what, 1972? First, he did his DBA. You mentioned your MBA, but back in the day, they used to do a doctorate in business administration. Oh, really? Yeah, they don't do that anymore. It's very rare. And then, yeah, I got his PhD. Mom came out and joined him a few years later. And like many people, they, they stuck around. And I was a technology guy and you know, big in data and analytics, and all sorts of fun stuff. I lived out the American dream, which was you know great to grow up actually seeing that. I mean, people hear about the American dream of you know immigrants coming with a few hundred bucks in their pockets. Yeah. And, and, you know, building businesses, building families and living well. And it was, it was great to be a firsthand witness to that. And so, you know, after a successful career of building companies, selling them in 2011, he exited the biggest company that he had founded. And somewhat as a retirement project, he decided he wanted to go out and create the next great American whiskey. And despite being Irish, he had a passion for single malts, which, you know, there are a few in Ireland, but, you know, they've always been more associated with Scotland. And, you know, the marketing people will, will ask me, well, you know, could we make them Scottish or could you make your whiskey Irish? But, <laughs> you know, I mean, people from California can like whiskey from Kentucky and people from Virginia can like, you know, wine from California, right? You don't well, necessarily absolutely. have to like your own thing. So, yeah, dad got off to the races in late 2011 got some land, got a big Scottish distillery system, started construction, and then about 18 months into it, took a heart attack, passed mm. suddenly. And dad and I have been working on various projects together. My background's in finance, and we've been doing you know investments in tech startups and you know various technology-oriented things, but we weren't working on the distillery together. It was just you know a project that he this had. This is passion uh, project. That, yeah, yeah, exactly. I knew very little about it. In fact, I was under the impression that it was operational um, oh. <laughs> because there was a blended product that they were working uh -huh. on with, with the brand and, you know, whiskey was going into barrels mm -hmm. and, you know, I'd only ever been to distilleries, you know, as a tour with, with mm -hmm. dad in Scotland, a, a random trip or something like that. So uh, all of that is to say that when he passed, I was very, very, very naive about the industry, about the process, about fundamentally about how difficult it would be to build yeah. a distillery. It sounded like, hey, whiskey, that's easy, right? You know, mm -hmm. technology and finance, that's very serious and difficult stuff. And, you know, how hard can whiskey be? I know like the drinking portion of the competition, right? That's uh -huh. probably the hardest part. And you know, that's next morning is the hardest part. Yeah, yeah. No, that's when the narrator just says, you know, and Gareth was very wrong. And so nine years later, instead of being very, very, very naive, I'm just very naive. I dropped one or two of the berries. And yeah, we've got it going. And so in 2013, there was the shell of the building and of course the stills, you know, the buildings built around the stills. Mm -hmm. And I was under the impression that 
you know, where's the on button? Let's go. <laughs> but turns out there's a lot of other things, you know, all your pipes and valves and the mill and the boiler system, the chiller system. Oh, yeah. And we built a visitor center so we could start bringing folks onto the site to see what we're doing. Uh, of course, there's the warehouses and the warehouses get bigger. Then you have new warehouses, then you have batting houses, then you have bottling houses. So it's been quite the journey since 2013. But when you took it over, or when you came on board in 2013, was your dad just tucking it away, aging it? Because you got it. it can't just really release it. No, so it wasn't even, I mean, the distillery wasn't operational at, oh. at that time. Okay. So he was working on a brand that would be imported from Scotland and then aged in port wine casks from Virginia. Oh. And that's what became our Virginia Highland Whiskey Series that we still have on the market. I think we just in the last six months passed where it's now like 48% of our sales and our American single malt is oh. now the majority. But yeah, so at that time, it was really just kind of a, well, I guess you would call that a non-distilling producer type project, and knowing, knowing that we would get there. Yeah, yeah. 100% potential. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But you know, we ran with that product, and what we ended up doing was over time, as we had our own whiskey that we laid down starting in 2015, that's when our first distillations happened, we would have one or two-year-old whiskey that we'd start blending in with mm -hmm. the Scottish single malt. And in early days, it was a thimble full and then 5%, uh 10%. -huh. You know, and as our whiskey aged, we started including more and more of it. And now we're, we're about 50-50 in terms of our own American single malt produced in the US that's blended into the Scottish single malt and then aged in port wine casks. That's the primary product. We also do a cider finish as well. Ooh, the cider finish. Is that, and how do you finish it in cider? Yeah, that one's a little more complicated than port, primarily because it's hard to find barrel aged cider. Uh, mm -hmm. And it also tends, barrel aged cider tends to be more of a dry cider, right? So, you know, kind of more of like the champagne style versus the, you know, what I think some of the major producers have done where it's sweeter and, you know, much, much more fruit forward versus the kind of the subtle apple tastes. So, or like back, there's a lot of ciders. I drink a lot of ciders. You can get a yeah. lot of sours going on there that I couldn't imagine going that, into it. That, that's right. That's right. And so we've actually had some sweeter ciders that we've aged our whiskeys in. And it's really a blend of different types, you know, some of the sweet, some of the dry that creates really interesting flavors that aren't like, you know, kind of kick you with the teeth, Jolly Rancher apple taste, right? It's a lot more subtle than that. You know, that there are apples there, but you know, you're not getting apples thrown at you. Yeah. You so want to reminisce. About it. You don't want to like, you don't want to feel like an Applejack or something. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. But we've actually used some uh, Applejack barrels because uh, okay. it's only like 10 or 15 miles up the road from us in central Virginia is where Laird's mm -hmm. does their brandy distillation. They do the aging, blending, and everything up in New Jersey, but their apple facility is very close to us. So oh, I had no idea. We get to borrow some barrels from time to time. So oh, that's cool. Cool. Oh, that's yeah. Cool. So I didn't know that. See, so your scotch is really a, well, not scotch, but your imported one is really an international blend. Yeah. Yeah. And so that makes it difficult to put in a category, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a specialty blend. But yeah, it's an American 100% malt and then Scottish 100% malt. Of course, together, we can't call them single malts. But you know, it blended the 100% malt product that then does a secondary maturation finish at our place in Virginia. What about the labeling laws on that? Can you put that a certain percentage comes from Scotland or how do you... Yeah, you know, now if we did that, we would have to be very careful about exactly how we did that. Mm -hmm. And really the Virginia Highland Whiskey product line, we now call it VHW. There's an international organization that did not want us to use the word Highland, so we just call it VHW now. Uh -huh. But labeling it has always been a, a little bit challenging. You'd ask, you know, could we give the exact blending ratio? Mm -hmm. Well, that product line is really how we internally got our own kind of competency and capacity in mm -hmm. blending. And each of the different casks that we're filling, you know, maybe if we filled them in the springtime, we had 60, 40 and okay, going down through the summer, we had some of the older stocks. So we were 50, mm -hmm. 50. Ultimately, when the blend is happening, we very quickly lose track of yeah. exactly the ratio of what went in. And so we could show you everything that went in, but then uh -huh. if you just saw the process of, okay, we're dumping these casks. Okay. Then we have something batted. Okay, well, then we're going to take that, that, move it over to here, mm -hmm. add this portion. Okay, and then we're going to bottle that, but we're going to leave, you know, a third of it ready for the next batch. Okay, and then something else gets... So, I mean, we thought about that and, you know, again, 
the health and marketing people never listen to these podcasts. But uh-huh. The marketing people, <laughs> the marketing people said, yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great if we could say exactly what the proportion mm-hmm. is. But we wouldn't honestly be able to say with any specificity exactly what any batch, what the proportions are. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you don't want to get in trouble with the TTP of saying, oh, it's exactly 50-50 when it's 55-45 or something like that. Mm -hmm. You can speak in generalities. But what a great go-to-market strategy, especially for a young distillery, because there is that gap when you're waiting for your whiskey to age. Out here, we have some craft producers that are selling white whiskey. (laughs) Just, yeah, you you're NH- well, you know, to be honest, that was part of our plan. I mean, we had a bottle that was all ready to go, Virginia Barley Spirit. And, mm-hmm. you know, we thought this was going to be great early revenue, you know, straight off the still. Mm-hmm. And again, back to the marketing folks, right? They very wisely, a young woman who was our first marketing director, spent like the first six months she was with us trying to convince me not to release that product. And she was successful and she was definitely right. We had this idea of Virginia Barley Spirit. It's going to be single malt, but 100% unaged. And she said, yeah, you know, people are going to think of that as moonshine. You know, we're here in central Virginia. It's not going to be the fine single malt that you think it is. So, moonshine. It is an acquired yeah, yeah. taste. I'm slowly acquiring the taste for the unaged whiskey. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And, and good luck with that uh, acquisition. The other way is just kind of putting the whiskey into these micro barrels where they can imitate six years of aging with in like six months. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I don't like to say that I'm I'm a traditionalist in any way, but I do like to listen to experts and, you know, Mm -hmm. consultants that we hire, right. You know, if we're looking for great advice and we have these great mentors in Scotland that, you know, have a century of experience in making whiskey and, you know, normally they tell me like when they're getting on the flight, but I feel Mm -hmm. like if we use micro barrels, like they wouldn't tell me and they'd come and like, you know, yank me out of my bed in the middle of the night. Uh-huh. But yeah, our smallest barrels are 200 liters. So those are the former bourbon barrels. Then we have hogsheads. We have plenty of these big 500 liter sherry butts. Oh, so, oh, wow. Yeah. I have nothing against the smaller barrels, but you can definitely, I can definitely taste it. Yeah. And you know, there's a place, a time and place for everything, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, where we are in central Virginia, it's not dissimilar from central Kentucky in terms of the Mm -hmm. climate, you know, Mm -hmm. the heat and humidity. It gets, I mean, about a month ago, it was pretty miserable here, right? You know, you're deep in the 90s, we get well past the hundreds. And then, you know, the humidity gets to like 187%. I don't even know how that's possible, but it's just feels like it's it's unpleasant. And then the winters, you know, still a few months away here, but it gets pretty chilly. And we get a couple feet of snow on the ground and then very dry. Yeah, And so, you know, you compare that kind of, you know, very dynamic climate to, climates in Scotland or Ireland, or even those certain areas that they're aging whiskey in Japan. Mm -hmm. And they tend to be a lot more mild where, you know, day to day and season to season, you just don't have those same massive swings. Last month I was visiting my mom in Ireland and, you know, it's whether you're going in August or whether you're going in January, your suitcase Mm kind of looks the same. Yeah. You always hope it's going to be like really warm or you'll see mm-hmm. snow, but it's, it's always somewhere in the middle. So we're able to get a good amount of maturation in a relatively short period of time using larger barrels just due to the climate. And then the weather and the humidity, I would think it would actually have a positive effect on the aging. Yeah, There's yeah, absolutely. So, that send their whiskey around the globe so it can travel around the equator a few yeah. times to smooth it out. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, one of the ways I explain it to folks who are, you know, in the industry is... A lot of people have a back deck off their house. I mean, certainly Mm -hmm. out east, you know, you have a a pine or oak deck. And, you know, in the winter, it gets really loose. You know, screws Mm -hmm. kind of pop up and it kind of seems like it might fall apart. But, you know, when summer comes back, it tightens up again. And so if you think about that same kind of phenomenon happening in the cask, you have in the winter, it's, you know, everything's tightening up and squeezing things into the barrel or into the contents. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, back in the summer, as it's, you know, expanding, it's pulling stuff back into the wood. Mm-hmm. That's when you don't necessarily want to dump it, right? Because oh. a lot of the good stuff is inside the wood. Oh, it's been sad. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and so we like to think that the best time is, you know, kind of spring after you've kind of started to warm up and squeezed oh. the staves back together, gotten the, it's almost like a tea bag, right? Squeezing the last little uh-huh. bits out of what's left there. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah, I, I can definitely testify to the wood expanding. We're down in San Diego and it's never humid here, but we've had a really humid and none of our doors close right now. <laughs> all, there, exactly. There it all is. Kind yep. of expanded. Nothing yep. quite fits yep. in our house right now. <laughs> yep. That's exactly the same with the barrels. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. And, and if you think about it with barrels, you're right. Yeah, the whiskey just goes right up into it. That's fantastic. So talk yeah. to me about American single malt. Yeah. So, you know, American single malt is really all we produce out of our stills. We've historically been blending it with an imported product, but the product that we released just two years ago is our own American single malt. It's really what we're all about. And getting a category as a formal designation by TTB really meant a lot to us because, you know, we're kind of stuck in the other category of whiskey, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're not bourbon, we're not rye, we're in other and you kind of get lost in the fold there of you know, different blended whiskeys and corn whiskeys and quinoa whiskeys, wheat whiskeys, all sorts of you quinoa know, whiskey. I don't think I've heard that. I haven't had that one yet. I've had it moving right along. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we kind of get lost in there. And so, you know, internationally, malt whiskey is sold a lot more than, mm -hmm. you know, what we would think of as whiskey with you know, bourbon and rye. Mm -hmm. And so that definition of single malt was really put there not by you know guys like me and and other producers like you know Westland in Seattle or mm -hmm. uh, let's see Westward in Portland you have Stranahan's out of Denver you have Balcones in Texas we all got together I gotta mention Malahat my favorite down in San Diego Th there you go there you go yeah well, I mean, there's huge volumes of single malt producers, yeah. but we got together back in 2016 and, you know, like in these small industries, small guys have to work together and, you know, rising tide lifts all of our boats. Oh, yeah. And we recognized that we needed to have a category that was defined just like, you know, we had with bourbon or rye or, you know, any sort of product out there. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we worked with the TTB and we really just wanted to have the consumer expectation that was set by Scotland and Ireland, Japan, and so on, that what does single mean? Well, it means that it's distilled entirely one distillery, right? It's not a blend of different types of styles. It's a certain style. Malt is malted barley. You can mm -hmm. malt other grains, but malted barley is the expectation. And then America, that's the easy part, just has to be, you know, mashed, distilled, and matured in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And that's American single malt. Oh. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. Is there any age requirements on it or? No. So there's some other requirements, but they're all within the existing classification that TTB has for whiskeys. And so let's see, matured in oak casks, not exceeding 700 liters. Mm -hmm. there, we had nothing against, you know, 800 liters. It's mm -hmm. just that it was, you know, already in the regulations to be whiskey distilled no more than 160 proof and then bottled at 80 proof or more. And so those are things that just already existed in the regs and mm -hmm. it would be just process wise, it'd be like we'd be peeling back the category of whiskey if we didn't have those as part of it. So, yeah, those are kind of the ancillary portions of the definition, but the core parts are just, you know, 100% malted barley, distilled entirely one distillery, and it's made here in the US. Huh. It's very, very interesting. For some reason, yeah. I don't know, I always listen to single malt, and I think it's got to be a single type of malted barley. But it's really yeah, you know, we've gotten that too, or a single type of any sort of malt, right? Because you can malt lots of different grains. Yeah. And there is an existing definition that goes way, way back of a malt whiskey that just has to be 51% of any type of malted grain. Okay. And you can malt a lot of things. Mm -hmm. You can malt rye. I know there are folks that are malting rye out there. Mm -hmm. You can malt wheat. And I mean, I'm sure if you work hard and believe in yourself, you could probably malt quinoa. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I just, now, that now I got to research that. Um, yeah. Yeah. But that was part of the challenge was that, you know, the U S the definition for malt was, you know, anything that was malted, but you know, the U S didn't really build malt whiskey, right. You know, the, the Scots primarily did. And mm -hmm. they set that expectation that when you say malt, you need malted barley. So yeah. And that's what the vast majority of producers out there had been doing. So it wasn't terribly difficult to get a group together to advocate for that definition with the federal tax and trade bureau, and I think what there's well over 200 products on the shelf that are American single malts by over a hundred producers. Wow. So, it, I mean, it's a nascent category I and mean, certainly in volumes, it's still quite small, but I think it's a great place for innovation. You know, a lot of different areas between bourbon, rye, and even, you know, vodkas, tequilas, everything else have been explored. But I think having something that the rest of the world has, you know, kind of owned for a while, bringing it to the U.S. and making it our own is, I don't know, it's part of a great American tradition, right? I mean, well, we're a nation of immigrants. And, you know, when you think about those great things that folks bring from the old country, you know, people in the old country would say, no, that's not real. That's not mm -hmm. authentic. 
well, it is authentic. I mean, it's something that somebody brought to the U.S. and made their own. Um, mm-hmm. You know, whether you know, pizza, well, heck of a lot more popular in the new world here, right? I mean, it's where tomatoes are from and so on. Oh, yeah. Frankfurters and, and hamburgers. And, you know, those might seem like ancient things when, you know, you'd say, oh, you know, in the 1800s and coming to the turn of the centuries when you had all this immigration. But one example I like to give is, you know, if 20 years ago or maybe 25 years ago, if we said, hey, there's some you know, guys on the West Coast that are eating fish raw and they're putting some rice around it, you know, <laughs> sounds crazy. But now, you know, I can order sushi to be here in 20 minutes in Charlottesville, Virginia, mm-hmm. but it's not going to be exactly, you know, what they're going to be serving in Tokyo, right? It's not a copy of yeah. something that came over from the, the old world. I mean, you know, we had cream cheese and you know, we make it our own, right? The Philadelphia uh-huh. roll would get you in trouble in, in Tokyo, but it's delicious here. And so yeah. it's that kind of model that I think about for American single malts that, you know, we're not trying to just recreate something. Mm-hmm. It's not scotch that's made mm-hmm. here in the US. It's something that we make for ourselves to our own flavors, to our own yeah. likes and make it our own. Yeah. And talking about flavors, I know it's, this is an impossible question to answer, but you can talk about your particular house style. You've got scotch mm-hmm. and I can, I kind of have a mental image of all the bottles of scotch I drank and then some yeah. uh, Irish malts and then Japanese. Where would you mm-hmm. see, see American malt fitting in? Yeah. Well, you know, it's an interesting question because, you know, the U S is so, so large and diverse that mm-hmm. there really isn't, you know, a house style for the country that I think mm-hmm. would really define it. I mean, you know, we think of Scotland, even though it's a much smaller area, I mean, just the massive history and, and, mm-hmm. and heritage that they have there means that they have distinct styles like, you know, an Isla where it's going to be mm-hmm. you know, extremely peaty and smoky, you know, Highlands where it's going to be a little lighter and, you know, towards the fruity side, some of the, you know, Campbelltown or Lowlands and so on that have their own style. And so I think similar in the U.S., there's going to be distinct regional styles, particularly in the way that, you know, things are aged because Mm -hmm. if you're aging, you know, in a kind of, you know, call it a bourbon-like climate in Virginia, it's Mm -hmm. going to be very different than if you had even the same distillate, which obviously is going to be slightly different. But if you aged it in Texas or, you know, mile high in Denver or, you know, in a rainy Pacific Northwest. So I think, you know, there's not quite a house style yet, but I think some of the big differences would be with some other producers, not necessarily Virginia Distillery Company, there's a lot of use of, of new wood, right? Uh-huh. So bourbon and rye would have a lot of first use new oak uh, for, mm-hmm. for aging, which gives it a lot more of the wood and a little less of the grain. And you know, by law in Scotland and Ireland, you can't use new wood, it has to be used. And so you know, that's kind of something somewhat unique to the US. Again, with my business, we use used wood because we were a little more traditional, but mm-hmm. You know, doing it in a different type of climate makes it uh, a little different than you get anywhere else. Sure. And so courage and convictions, your American single malt. In the flavor right. profile, yep. where does that fit in? So I would say that that's, again, more on the traditional side. But if you're comparing it to something you're used to, like a mm-hmm. scotch, it would be definitely a lot more fruit forward. And there's really two places that comes from. Number one, we use two different types of yeast, one that's traditional, more for alcohol production, another that is really focused on these kind of tropical fruit ester product. That's kind of the magic that we put in there. And then the other part is from our casks. We use three different types of casks primarily. About half are former bourbon barrels, 25% are what we call our cuvee casks. They're in the industry known as STR, shave, toast, rechar. Mm-hmm. That's a red wine cask that's been broken down and kind of refurbished. And then the last 25% are various types of sherry. Mm-hmm. Those are those 500 liters, you know, mega sherry butts. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of fruit in our flavor. And I think that would kind of be our house style is very fruit forward of mm-hmm. whiskey. Oh, very good. Now, as far as so nine years into this of production, how have you ramped up and the challenges you face ramping up and then distributing this? Yeah, you know, it's like each stage gets a little harder. You know, building the distillery out, you know, that was a challenge because I didn't have any sort of background in engineering mm-hmm. or construction and, and or <laughs> whiskey making at large. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, fine tuning the stills exactly to these specifications that you know, our mentors had put together for us. That seemed like, you know, once we've gotten there, you know, that's the hard part. And again, I was wrong. Then it's the aging, you know, the patience and the size of our stills. We have 10,000 liter stills and they're pot stills. So it's a okay, batch process. Say, yeah. They're really, really hard to run slow, right? Mm-hmm. So you can't half fill them, right? Or quarter fill them. You know, there's a certain batch. And then once you start doing that, if you can't do one a week, right? You know, it's at four a week, 
it's like the minimal efficiency. And we're doing right now, we're doing anywhere between six and nine mashes a week because it's just that much more efficient. And so what I'm getting to is really since we started in 2015, we've been producing a large volume, knowing that it was going to take, you know, four or five, six years to age. And, you know, you're kind of looking off into the horizon of, you know, how much volume you need at those future uh-huh. dates. And then of course, when you do that, you have to build the road from here to there and getting out to distribution. So we use the Virginia Highland whiskey product line, kind of to cut our teeth and get some initial distribution and understanding of how it all worked. And that was what, from 2014 through 2019. And then we went, you know, for much more expanded distribution. So we launched Courage and Conviction, the American single malt. And when was that one? Well, it was perfect timing. You know, we have this great foresight of launching a brand where, you know, it takes, it's probably 18 months in advance. We picked out the timeline because uh-huh. you got to get your glass, you got to get all the marketing stuff together, you got to get design, you got to get supply chain going, you got to get things filled. And I think we were probably filling bottles in January of 19, you know, getting them out to distributors in January and February of 19. And then wow. the goal was get them on the shelves by April of 20. And yeah, then the weirdest thing happened. There was this entire uh, global pandemic. I don't know if you guys heard about it, but uh-huh. it, uh, yeah, it really freaked us out. So we launched in April of 2020, which was oh, wow. you know, at that oh. time just seemed like the world was collapsing and that it was the worst possible time. But yeah. you know, I caught the last flight out of Ireland before they shut down the country. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like March uh, 12th. I I was on a full distillery tour right there Yeah, before the pandemic really hit Ireland. And yeah, that's my pre-pandemic. Yeah. 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 Almost got not not the worst place to be stuck though, right? Oh, it It was fantastic. There's so many brands launched right at that time. I know. I know. Well, I mean, you kind of go back and you think, okay, well, shoot, you know, if all these brands and new distilleries were coming online, but when we were, right? Than to have you know three four five year old whiskey and that was launching around 2020, mm-hmm. but you know it's better to be lucky than being smart, right? And uh, or to be Irish better than being smart because mm-hmm. it actually ended up being a bit of a tailwind for us because you know folks were staying at home, not going to the on premise, and they were going you know in, in March and early April they were doing pantry stocking and everybody going for you know one seven five liters of you know vodka at their nearest store, but uh-huh. as things went on, you know. People started looking into discovery brands. So they were, you know, looking for new things for entertaining at home, e-commerce and direct mm-hmm. consumer shipping very quickly, you know, became popular and we were right place, right time. Were you selling online pre-pandemic? No, no. I mean, a lot of the online selling was the result of you know, like emergency regulatory orders. So mm-hmm. in Virginia, we made the big push to get, we're in a control state, right? Where everything has to go through the state. Oh yeah. I spent my morning this morning at Virginia ABC headquarters and it wasn't legal to ship oh. until I think it was April 5th. So, I mean, that shows you how quickly they turned around to say, hey, we're going to allow you to ship just inside the state. And then, you know, in other states, things changed. And so we worked with different, you know, e-com partners and, you know, various ways that we could, you know, direct from our website to other folks where they could ship within their state. And it worked. So, mm-hmm. and a lot of those things became permanent after the pandemic. So we're still able to do direct-to-consumer shipping in Virginia. So one of those nice little things, along with hand sanitizer that happened during the pandemic for oh, yeah. distilleries. Did you guys start distilling hand sanitizer? Distributing? We did. I mean, I was one of those folks that was like in pure panic mode in the front mm-hmm. end, right? <laughs> so when my wife and I were expecting our third son during that time. And, you know, <laughs> nobody knew what was going on at the front end. And so it was just nerve wracking. And, you know, I would drive down to the distillery every morning and, you know, we'd be geez, it wasn't until like later in April that people started wearing masks. Mm-hmm. I have this great photo where it's a bunch of guys on the bottling line and we're filling these like 200 ml sample bottles of our hand sanitizer. You know, we got our FDA emergency authorization and, you know, it was like an Avery label that we printed with like, mm-hmm. you know, whatever the FDA wanted to put mm-hmm. on there. And we're all sitting there, you know, like maybe using our elbows to touch each other because mm-hmm. that brings your faces closer to one another. No masks, right? Because uh-huh. we didn't know uh, uh-huh. at the time. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, 2020, I mean, the smell of our own hand sanitizer, you weren't allowed to put any additives into it, like any fragrances. And so it just smelled like, you know, malt whiskey. Uh-huh. <laughs> You know, Amazon okay. deliveries, you know, you spray them down, you know, you get the Instacart, you spray uh-huh. that down, you know. 
I'd spray myself down. I'd come home. I don't know if you had this experience at the front end of the pandemic, but you know, like just that paranoia. Of, I would come home, and of course, you know, pregnant wife. I would mm-hmm. strip down in the garage and throw my clothes into like you know a trash bag, and then go down. You know, my older kids would have a great laugh, and I go straight to the shower, and then you know, just be scrubbing everywhere. But, my brother-in-law that's the way he he entered the pandemic the yeah started. yeah i've recovered since then you know I've, okay like we're fine but on the front end i was a panicker mm-hmm. yeah we never got it but yeah we were yeah we, we, it's just my wife and i that live here so we didn't have uh, any kids to worry about so we were yeah we were a little just sheltered in place yeah yeah no and i had to go to the distillery and you know if i didn't go there it was, it'd be hard to get the other guys to show up too right so long as we were there it was a nice thing to be able to make hand sanitizer because i think you know i mean it's a crazy time nobody knows what's going on and like mm-hmm. distillers and you know bottling staff and so on you know we had to shut down our visitor center hey visitor center staff come help bottle and you know the world you know is potentially falling apart around us and people think oh why are we just making whiskey well, shoot, it's pretty meaningful to be able to make hand sanitizer at the same time. So, yeah. No, it was great the way it was all retooled. So, I mean, benefits yeah. and hindsight, online sales, it was the biggest boom that the industry could have gotten for like actually direct to consumer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, that stuff was all trending that direction. And I imagine we probably would have ended up in the same place over, over 10 years. It just kind of took you know, that 10 year regulatory path and condensed it down into, you know, in some cases, a few weeks, and then for the permanent stuff, a few years. So yeah, yeah, no, the industry definitely got kind of modernized a bit just as a result of the pandemic. Yeah. So the visitor center is up and running again. You're it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. To, it's great to see. Yeah. It took a while to get things back and running from, you know, wanting to focus on production. Right. And you know, we're pretty remote and having people walk around on tours, some folks nervous. And so it was good to kind of keep it just our small group. I mean, we wore masks for the longest time and geez, it was only what four or five, six months ago in you know, close quarters and like the bottling house that we took the masks off. But yeah, I mean, you could tell people were getting, you know, nostalgic for days when, you know, they could have friends and family come through and show yeah. off what they do. And so it's been great to have the visitor center back open and I remember, I remember the first few weekends, you know, after like, it was like 18 months that we were shut down the first Mm -hmm. few weekends or even like a Friday afternoon, you know, we'd be talking just the staff and then, you know, you'd see some random people walking around and say, well, who the the hell is that? (laughs) Like, oh no, no, no. We have a visitor center. People just walk through nowadays. It's like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Be nice to them. Don't tell them they're trespassing. So (laughs) yeah, no, it's, it's great to be back up and running. So. Yeah, as far as hospitality in general, like going forward, mm-hmm. what role does it place? Is most of your emphasis on the experience at the place or how do you use hospitality to reinforce your brand, I guess is the question. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good question. And so we have a lot of other agribusinesses, as they're called, you know, breweries, wineries, cideries, pretty near us. And, mm-hmm. you know, when folks come through, we're not in a major population center. And so we don't have people that are going to be, you know, passing through to, you know, relax after work or, you know, repeat visitors. When people are coming to visit, they're going a good distance. You know, they're on one of those tour buses or, you know, they have a designated driver to go to a handful of places. And so we're really trying to give them, you know, an experience, right? Something that they haven't seen before, something that's a little more, you know, touch and feel and and actually go up and walk through the distillery. Don't touch the things that say hot, don't touch, Mm -hmm. but, you know, the other things you can touch and, that's something that's kind of different, I think, from wineries where it's only really harvest season that you're going to be going through the production facility. People like to see, you know, the big copper pot stills and yeah. feel them still being hot and get those smells that, you know, they can have on a tour that those same smells that my entire life smelled like during the pandemic with hand uh-huh. sanitizer. Yeah. But yeah, we like to make it as hands-on as possible and get people to, you know, hey, smell what the mash, you know, smells like when on the front end. Here's what it is during fermentation and you taste what something straight off the stills is like. I think the biggest sensory thing is going to the warehouses where, you know, suddenly this kind of, right when you open the door, you get this huge you know, hit of, oh, yeah. of the, the aging whiskeys. You know, everybody says, ooh, that is the angel share. It must be so great. It's like, yes, all those lost profits going right out the door makes me feel great. It must have been you know, somebody like me that was like, yeah, yeah, just call it the angel share. It'll make you feel better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As we're kind of kind of wrapping down here, you're also a president of the Virginia Distillers Association or past president? You, you know, I, I'm the past president now. Yeah, I actually at ABC this morning saw the new president. I ran it for five years from 16 to 21. And 
We got some great things done, you know, just like I was talking about the American Single Malt Commission, you know, a group of small producers recognizes pretty quickly that power in numbers and a rising tide lifts all boats. And so Virginia has a ton of producers. That's one of our little secrets. We have more DSPs, so more distilleries than either Kentucky or Tennessee. Wow. It's just that they're much smaller, right? Yeah. So we don't have, you know, mega distilleries out there. It's, you know, smaller groups. And it is particularly challenging in, in a control state and that it's fairly new, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's only the last 10 or 15 years that craft distilleries have been growing. And so there are a lot of just, you know, simple things like, I mean, in the beginning, there's having a distillery store where we're actually allowed to do tastings and sell yeah. as an agent of the ABC. And then, you know, over time, simple things like, you know, being How does events. that work? You're allowed to sell out of your distillery or no? Yeah. Yeah, we are. And so basically, if you buy a hat or like a t-shirt or something like that, that's just like a regular retail transaction. But if you want to buy a bottle, then technically you're buying it not from us, you're buying it from the state. And there's this entire strange set of economics where you don't have you two different cash of the do you? you have the Some people do. Some that. people do. No, we're able to integrate them. Okay. But it is something like that because the funds then go to different places. And so mm-hmm. We take 100% of the retail and send it to Richmond. And then after a few weeks, they send us back the wholesale portion. And so it was very challenging because, you know, even though the product didn't leave, you know, a couple hundred yard radius from where it was, you know, distilled and bottled and consumed, you know, we were paying the state for our own product. So that was another one of the things we were able to do with the, the Distillers Association. We got this commission structure where they gave us an extra 20% back, made it a little more viable as a business to have a distillery store. And yeah, things have worked out great in the state. And, you know, as we get a little bigger, it's nice to see, you know, not just our brands, but also, you know, other Virginia brands grow well within Virginia and then definitely outside Virginia as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I was looking at your, the, I guess the distillery tour that you have on the association site looks pretty interesting. Yeah. 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 Spirits trail. I mean, Obviously, wine in, in the U.S. is much bigger uh, West Coast, but Virginia is actually the fifth largest wine producing state. We're right behind New York. Oh. Yeah, we've had a few Virginia wine producers on the show. A lot of challenges <laughs> with the humidity. I think they, that's right. Yeah. They wrestle with it a little, a little more with the grapes and the more. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a completely different animal there. I mean, being able to distill something is one thing, but being able to farm, I don't think I'd be a very good farmer. <laughs> no. I was also worried about that during the pandemic, too. It's like, I'm going to be a horrible farmer if it comes down to it. <laughs> Return to the ground. It's, so it's, yeah. kind of as we're wrapping down and you were kind of thrown into the distillery in 2013. Yeah. Now, nine years later, you, you're... So yeah, what keeps you motivated and what do you look forward most to this role? But that sounds like an obvious question, but I don't think I've been asked it in a good while. You know, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is just maybe it sounds obvious, but what keeps me going is like the next stage, uh-huh. right? You know, starting with, okay, let's get construction done. Okay, let's get distillation done. Okay, let's get things in warehouse. Okay, let's get this brand out. And mm-hmm. so it's almost like, you know, one foot after the other. And so there's always the next stage to go. And so, you know, I, I think right now, I mean, it's great where we are right now. We have an awesome product on the shelf. You know, consumers have been, you know, it's gotten great reviews, expanding distribution. And so, I mean, I think what keeps me going now is going to that next stage of continuing to expand distribution. We have a lot of inventory, plenty to share. And so, you know, just last year went into Texas, this year going into California. This year, we also started going to Asia as well. And so, you know, next thing is really taking all those years of, of hard work of obviously not just me, a whole ton of people and being able to share it with the world because we're that's really like, proud of it. And, be, you know, that's, that's, I think, what keeps me going is just whatever's next. So like building a great company is a great motivator and a great dream. Like there's only yeah, so much yeah. I'm helping activate my father's dream. You have to. Yeah, find yeah, something yeah. For them. It sounds like you have. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, to be dead honest, I mean, I think my dad would be more happy about building a business, right, uh-huh. than building a, a whiskey business or a data business or a you know telecom business or whatever, right? It, mm-hmm. That being able to take something and get a group of people together and make something bigger than themselves, it's really fulfilling. And you know, I saw my dad do that a couple times over growing up, mm-hmm. and I think whether it was whiskey or whether it was you know <laughs> wine or whether it was you know, televisions, you know, being able to build something and, and enjoy the journey through it is, is really what it's all about. Absolutely. Super gratifying. So yeah, yeah. where can people find out more about you and the Virginia Distillery Co.? 
Yeah, yeah, we got our website, uh, vadistillery.com. Obviously, all the same social handles, VA Distillery. And we're available in 27 states. You can get us wow. shipped most places. And yeah, our website has a great whiskey finder where you can either find it at a local retailer or on premise, or if not, you can order it on econ. Awesome. Well, Gareth, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Appreciate it. You have a great day. You too. Thanks for listening to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes. Thank you.